So without further ado, let me hand over to Anna and um, obviously um, all that she has to say. So thank you for having me here today. I'm, um, I've got quite a booming voice, so apparently lots of people have told me, so I hope it's just about right. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist. I work at South London and the Maudsley, which is the Mental Health Trust south of the river, I'm afraid. Um, it's a bit dangerous for me coming north to the river. <laughs> but um, our trust is a, so it's a mental health trust. We cover five of the South London boroughs. And I work in a very small bit of that trust. So I work in the brain injury uh, ward and in the memory disorders clinic. So the memory disorders clinic is based at St Thomas's, and um, I've been working there for a little while now. Um, but for a number of years, I've had a particular interest in primary progressive aphasia, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm actually going to talk about a research project um, that I'm in the midst of. Um, and where, how I got there, and talk a little bit about the literature. So a bit about research in this area, really. Um, the research project I'm going to talk about to you has been funded by Guys and St Thomas's Charity, and I'm actually it's being supervised by a lecturer for a speech and language therapy lecturer from UCL. So it's quite a um, we're quite pleased we got this funding so, and hopefully we want to get more funding so I want to talk to you about it to get your opinions on it as well later on today if that's alright so I'm going to talk about a bit about what the literature says already in, uh, so a bit about what other research is going on in speech therapy okay, and what speech therapists are actually doing in real life with people with primary progressive aphasia. So I've done a bit of a survey recently and um, asked some questions of speech and language therapists, mainly in the London area, to find out what what is the therapy people are actually doing with people with primary progressive aphasia. And then I'm going to talk about my project. And my project is looking at conversation training or communication training, we're calling it, for people with primary progressive aphasia, but also for their partners, so their family members, their husbands or wives or children, whoever is the main person they chat to on a daily basis. So um, I chose this image. This is a military drill performed by a mixed class of students in 1916, and it was some of, an example of the earliest aerobic classes that kids were being taught at school, and I thought it was quite nice because it kind of... It kind of represented to me some of the earlier therapies that speech therapists were using with people with dementia. So we'd all, all the people with dementia would get lumped in together into groups to do a lot of therapy. And really we didn't know if it was working because everyone was in together. So it's hard to tell what works for who. So now what we're finding is that um, we're a bit more specific. We're trying to be a bit more specific. We're trying to work on a more one-to-one -one level with people. And we call that person-centred in, in the NHS. Um, and we really, there's lots more research going on with people with primary progressive aphasia with the three different variants as well. So with the three different variants, I don't know if you've heard the words like logopenic or semantic or non-fluent achromatic. So lots more research looking at each different variant and what therapy works for each different person really and that kind of started with um, researchers doing looking at case studies so they're looking at people they've seen and what therapy worked with that person and what didn't and then also smaller groups um, of patients they're putting them together and it's really focusing on what we call naming therapies so the majority of the researchers focused on this so it's things like working on lists of words, say 20 words, and doing exercises every day, kind of like practicing, drilling, which one, and looking at the, um, what the words mean, their, what, they're, what they're actually linking them with the real life, so looking at photos of those objects, what they're used for, what the, what the word starts and fit ends with, what the word rhymes with, to really get those words really firm in that person's mind and try and maintain those words so they don't lose those words. And the research 
research has shown that that kind of therapy can work, um, but it does need to be practiced every single day. And I found that lots of people found this really useful, but lots of people it doesn't work for them. We're all different. And that therapy, I had one guy who did that kind of speech therapy. He was a, um, a carpenter, and he was he still owned his own business, and he we. Um, it was like he had a cassette tape in his car and we made a cassette of all the words that he wanted with all the definitions and it was all things like his different stores and his different script, I don't really know. And we tape recorded them and he drives to work and he played the definitions over and over again and he had a set of pictures in his pocket and before he went into that home base, he'd kind of remind himself of the words and then put them back in and he'd really work on them every day. But that, I've also met people who really don't like that. That's not their cup of tea. Um, so, what else is there in the research? So there are other things in the research. Um, in fact, in general, looking at generally as dementia, there's actually more money and time being spent on carer training at the minute. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the START programme, which has been in the... Um, the Daily Mail, it's hit the tabloids, it's come, that's come out of UCL, um, that is run by Jill Livingston, and it's basically they've shown that working with carers can reduce the burden and, and make people feel better, essentially, um, but actually that's more looking at the psychological side of, of how people are managing. Um, and there's been some other programmes in dementia that have looked at communication and there's a programme called the Focus Programme that was, it's a training programme for nurses and, ha and it's trained them to talk to people with dementia and there's been some training for relatives of people with dementia but really it's a very it's, it's basically, I call it a dictatorial programme. It's a programme where someone stands in front of a room of people and says, do this, do this, this, do this. So it's not really working one-on-one -on -one with people, okay? And what they've actually recommended, this programme has recommended there needs to be more one-on-one -on -one work. So things that are more tailored to individuals because everyone's different. Um, so, let's have a look at primary progressive aphasia. I don't know if any of you recognise this lady. She was um, she competed for Britain at the Commonwealth Games this year and won um, in the weightlifting. She's called Zoe, and I thought this kind of represents the situation that, in a way, that people with primary progressive aphasia face. So um, I was looking at it with one of my other speech therapy colleagues, and we were saying that people with primary progressive aphasia are kind of losing some of the muscles that Zoe has. And their family and their carers and their husbands and wives and children are having to take more of the weight as well, in conversation sometimes, but they're struggling as well. So everyone, the person with primary progressive aphasia and their family are struggling under the weight of conversation a little bit. Um, and looking at the research and what speech therapists are doing for conversation, it's only, again, it's just a couple of examples where people have written down kind of, oh, good examples, or this is what I did with this person and, and their relative that it seemed to work. So, for example, there was a, there's a relatively well-known case of a gentleman called Bobby V and his wife, and um, they explained to the wife, his wife how primary progressive aphasia was affecting his conversation, and suddenly she realised that he wasn't, she thought he'd been maybe being a bit selfish, but actually he wasn't. And that's the kind of thing that they, that they found through this kind of training. And I know you've all heard, some of you may have heard from Jackie Kindell. Um, she spoke earlier this year. And she's also looking at relationships and conversation. And she's actually um, been making some recommendations that speech, that she's a speech therapist, that speech therapists need to spend more time and energy on this area as well. Um, so there is gradually, slowly, a bit more of a focus on conversation. So now, this is a bit of information that I collected. I did a survey. I sent it out across some kind of network group, professional networking groups in London, some speech therapists, to look at what speech therapists do and what's happening. So what, what are they seeing in terms of the people who refer to them? And 33% of speech therapists who responded to my survey 
said that actually they'd seen lots more people being referred to them with the diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia or perhaps primary progressive aphasia. And they were being involved more. And actually the majority of those referrals were coming from psychiatrists. And actually they were saying that a lot of the psychiatrists were much better informed about primary progressive aphasia since about, in the last kind of, I'd say, eight years, six to eight years, but it's only in the last few years that they're seeing more referrals. And it's because the different, you know, I was talking about the three different variants of primary progressive aphasia. They, they used to be only two recognised variants, and recently there's a third, this third variant called logopenia, which was recognised. And since then, lots more psychiatrists seem to be aware of language and primary progressive aphasia and speech therapy. So this is looking good for us. Um, yeah. um, and then they've also, speech therapists are also saying, however, that um, there's a big bit of a variety in the number of sessions that they have to, gi to give therapy, to, to do therapy with people with primary progressive aphasia. And there was a kind of average that it was about three sessions, which isn't very much at all. Um, so there was some had a lot more and some had a lot less really dependent, but three was about the average. So I asked people what they do with those three sessions, and what they said was that they, they do a lot of what I was thinking they did. They do a lot of work on conversation, a lot more than I thought. So they were doing a lot of work, a bit of work on kind of suggesting for education and saying these are really good strategies to use. Everyone said these good, these good I say strategies, do you know what I mean by strategies? So um, some people are nodding. So strategies are things like um, tips and hints, really. Like make sure that you have turned the telly off when you're chatting to each other, or maybe use shorter sentences. Those kind of tips and hints. And people were giving out lists of tips and hints. Um, but they were also doing things like making videos of people, of the person and their family member having a conversation and then showing that person these videos and saying, what do you think's happening? Look, this is great. Did you realise that you were doing this? Or did you know that this wasn't working so well? So, so letting people see their own conversation and actually work out themselves what was going on. Does that make sense? Um, and they also said a lot of people were doing demonstrations on, on how to use tips and hints as well. So saying, okay, I'll have a conversation with the person, the, primary, your, your, the person who's come to see me, my patient, and I'll show you some good ideas of communication. And now you have a go. So using a newspaper to have a chat, or using a picture to have a chat about, and then actually saying, now you have a go at that. Do the same thing. Lots of practicing. So, moving on to my study. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah, I'll, I've got lots of time for questions at the end. Yes, of course. What kind of response rate did I get? Um, so there were, I sent it out through two networks. I got 23 people responding. It doesn't sound that many, but I, it is a lot. But a few of you may know how difficult it is to meet a speech therapist who've actually got some experience of working with people with primary progressive aphasia. So for London, it's it's, it was quite good. Um, I'm planning a bigger study, a bigger survey across the UK, but um, we'll get to that. So I, um, in 2013, when I was on maternity leave, I won some funding for um, uh, to do some research. So I got the funding from Guys and St Thomas's Charity and we started it in April this year and uh, we're about halfway through. So it's, the study is based at the Memory Disorders Clinic at St Thomas's, I mentioned that's where I worked. And um, anyone who has got a diagnosis or a potential diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia or frontotemporal dementia that could be a primary progressive aphasia has been referred to the study, and I'm inviting them then, they're coming for them for an assessment with their family member or on their own, and I'm inviting them and their communication partner to come and get involved with the study. And um, it's, I guess it's what you call a pilot project. Um, so it's a very, very early study, and um, we, we, 
we're doing okay. So basically, I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing in the study. So um, this is a this is a screenshot from a. For, it's very complicated, but this is there was a, there's lots of evidence for working on conversation um, with people who've got stroke related language difficulties. Okay, and so there's lots of programs, and there's one particular program that I thought was really good because it um, and would suit the needs of, of people with primary progressive aphasia and also the amount of speech therapy we had. So it's a program called Better Conversations. It, it's a program that uses video. To video a person having a conversation. It, help, it has lots of handouts and um, information on what conversation is. So it, it helps the people and their family members look at the video with that information to understand what's going on and then it has lots of ideas on strategy so tips and hints that you could apply to the conversation so it seemed like a really ideal program so and it's quite flexible it's available on the internet and it's, it doesn't it can be run over as many sessions as you really want it to so it seemed like an ideal program and that, that's the program i've chosen and that's an example of, of, of them explaining what conversation is, okay? And so I've, um, I've been inviting people to, who've been referred to me to come for their assessment and then participate in four sessions of therapy of Better Conversation Therapy, this programme, okay? And in providing this programme, I'm, I'm trying to put, fit it into four sessions, which I know is one more than what the majority of people have, but I really feel that trying to work out whether three sessions, four sessions is already quite not that much really compared to what a lot of the people with stroke related day phase have. So kind of squeezing it down and seeing how it works. So this is the therapy I'm doing. This is a really in-depth description. So in the first session, I'm doing I'm giving people handouts. So I'm not just using what that was in the Better Conversation program. I'm do, making them up, making them more specific to people with primary progressive aphasia. And we're making a video explaining how conversation works, looking at the video to see what we can see happening. In the second com, in the second session, we really look at the video again in lots of detail and work out what we think, what tips and hints we all agree on. Then we're actually doing lots of practice lots of acting, role playing I call it sometimes, so having a go at these tips and hints and then actually thinking about in the fourth session I'm trying to think with people about the future because as we know primary progressive aphasia, people's communication doesn't stay the same, it will still change, so, so do people around, people around them need to, that person need to change as well so also equipping people to change with the changes does that make sense? So I've got a little example so you can see what I mean. Um, so this is an example of Mr. and Mrs. B. They're 62... The gent Mr. B was the person with primary progressive aphasia. He was 62 years old. He had been working as an international consultant but had to give up his role because of his, because of his communication difficulties. And he then started working as a security guard and um, a night security guard. And But he still has quite an active social life. He was going out scuba diving, things like that. And he was very frustrated, though, in his conversation. And his wife just thought he didn't care and didn't want to listen to him. That's what she, they, she thought when they came to me. And we, we um, started chatting, and Mr. Mrs. B, so his wife, said, if I, if I had communication difficulties, I would prefer people didn't look at me or help me. So I just never helped you. And we were looking at the video, and what was happening was that when Mr. B couldn't think of a word, his wife would look at the floor and look at the window and wait and not say anything. And when we looked at it, she said, well, that's what I would want you to do. And they hadn't ever talked about it. And he said, well, actually, I would prefer it if you helped me. And that was kind of, they didn't realise, they hadn't talked about it before. What we also saw, found, was that in the video, Mr B, so the gentleman with primary progressive aphasia, he talked the whole way through the video. And his wife hardly talked at all. She sat and she kind of said one word answer. She hardly talked at all. 
And she said, I just thought you didn't want, you weren't interested, you, you, you know, you didn't want to listen to me anymore. And his, and the person, Mr. B, the gentleman with primary progressive basic plagiarism, said, oh, I was so busy trying to get my words out and trying to tell you things, I didn't realise that's what you thought. And they've not talked about this either. So looking at the video, it was really helpful because they were able to pinpoint those things and work out why they'd been doing them. And we agreed then, in the therapy, that if Mr B wanted help, he should actually ask for it. They, they agreed that. And we agreed that, Ms, that she, he would actually wait more, so he'd take more silences, so he wouldn't try talking all the time. He'd just wait and let his wife get a word in her phrase too. Um, now his wife also said, because when we looked at the video, her way of not responding was to look at the ceiling look at the floor and it looked so awkward so we all agreed that that she would look at him more and so that she could keep an eye on whether he needed help or not and so that's where we talked about open body language so that she would look like she was listening to him and that she would really try and start a conversation she would really give it a bash and that she wouldn't just assume that he wasn't listening she'd actually have a go and when we kept doing the videos, sorry I'm in your way, when we kept doing the videos, we found that actually that the more they practiced it, the better they got at it, but it did need practice, okay? So that's, the th that's basically what the therapy was doing. So this lady was just saying for anyone who couldn't hear that um, she goes to the pub with her husband who's got lots of communication difficulties and he'll try and speak to you and so he'll be struggling to think of the word and he'll say this, you know, this, and he'll just make the shape of a square every time and then say, you know, you know, and she's trying to help but she doesn't know. And he gets cross because he thinks she, and you, you just really don't know. So he gets crosser and crosser the more you help him. And I would say that this, that's why it's important to look at everyone, everybody's different, aren't they? And so that's why we're looking at everyone's conversation individually. So I wouldn't say that what's worked for this couple would work for you, because they're a different couple, I totally agree. And your different personalities. Conversation is, a, is an expression of our personality, isn't it? So different people communicate in different ways. So I think it would be different for you and your husband, absolutely. Um, and I, I guess coming back to, right to the beginning of my presentation, when I was saying that, um, you know, there's, there's some programs that are really recipe based that said everyone should use these strategies. I don't I think that we also need things that are a bit more individual based where you look at each individual couple's style of communication and say, well what's working for you and your husband? And that's what one of the reasons I want to I I'm trying to get some more funding for this is because I found that because um, there isn't very much research in speech therapy. So when speech therapists are trying to get served get funding for services for dementia and people with primary progressive aphasia. I don't know if you've heard of these commissioners, these elusive commissioners of the NHS, who say, well, there's no research, there's nothing that says this is going to work, why should we pay for it? So one of the reasons I want to do something therapy-based is to show that it does work so that more people can get more speech therapy. Does that make sense? So there was a survey done a few years ago that said 60% of the NHS, so speak, it was a survey of speech therapists across the UK, and they said 60% of speech therapy services um, saw people with dementia, but mostly, so all dementia, sorry, you, it's usually strokes that they see, and there's, and there's pathways, whereas with dementia, they were saying it's, it's haphazard, it's ad hoc. No one pays attention. We knew the right person in the in that bit of the NHS service, and they gave us a bit of money. And then that per, then that speech therapist left, and then the service went, and we couldn't get another speech. So it's really, really ad hoc. Whereas with things like stroke, there's proper pathways. Because I completely agree with everything you're saying. But and so far, my therapy, the results of my therapy have been quite positive. So Mrs. B, Mr. and Mrs. B are one couple. And another couple who finished the therapy have also, um, the husband was said to me, you, you've helped me, our family, think and rethink how we communicate with, um, with, our, with our mother and wife. Um, and so 
everybody is individual and everybody is unique and everybody needs different communication strategies. Um, but we do need to record in some way that this therapy is working to show it. So we have to look at numbers and we call that qualitative and quantitative research as well. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm making a video of these people before and after the therapy and I'm using rating scales from the um, program that was developed for the stroke patients that's shown improvements. So I'm using the same kind of rating scales to show that conversation itself has changed. So not so much that the language has changed, but everyone's getting a turn or that there's not so much there's not so much conversational breakdown, which is different to language, but people working together to communicate more. And, and I'm also looking at rating scales of quality of life and um, confidence in communication and self efficacy There's a word called self efficacy Do you know what I mean by self efficacy So there's the idea that you can manage something on your own, that, where, that people feel that they're managing the conversation alone. And so I haven't got the data of that yet, but that's coming. But why my aim is, so this is my last slide basically, that to get the project finished, we've got funding runs out um, in April next year, and I hopefully, I've, so I've seen two couples, we've got a third couple who are in the middle, so hopefully we're going to get about five couples to up and um, what to do, and analyse the results, and I'm planning um, to apply for some more funding to run the programme at a bigger level, with more people, and um, and that's my next step. Um, so I'm also going to meet with the individuals who've done the therapy to see if they like it. Is it too long? Is it is it would it be better in outpatients or at home? Is it do you like being videoed? Do you hate being videoed? Did the therapists use the right handouts? Did they use the right words? So to see what, and one of the reasons I wanted to come here today as well is to get some ideas from you as well as far as does this sound rubbish or does it sound useful, too long, too short, all of that? I've got some questions for later. Um, and then that hopefully with that information, I can make sure whatever program that we do try again with more people, hopefully will be more, even more useful. I haven't excluded anyone myself. The person who, one couple excluded themselves because they found, because um, at the minute we only have, are able to do it on an outpatient, so people have to come to us, and the couple that decided that it was too much for them were finding the travelling too much, and I think, I would like, my feeling is it would be better to do it in people's homes, but at the minute, the money, so that's my next idea, was to, to find out what people like, but to see if we could do it, try it in people's homes as well, as part of the biggest, and so that's one of the ideas, but... I haven't excluded anyone. Yes. Yes. yes, please, sorry. I'm quite familiar. Unfortunately, um, it may be the case, I can't, I can't um, many local services do have, every service is different, but many local services do have only a certain amount of therapy available. But what many services are also will accept a re referral if there's something specific that they want you to work on. So a lot of services are based on you having a specific goal. So if you say, oh, I would like you to work on, we would really like this particular thing to be improved because we do a couple of sessions on this. And so some, some services will do that with you and other services won't. And the other thing, I, as you say, there's private services available. And I guess some, if there, are, there are some research studies going ahead, that, that is another, I'm trying to think outside the box, <laughs> um, and if there, that might be another avenue for getting this therapy, is to go and get involved in a research trial which is normally free, which is free test. One thing I have done, because I agree, it's a very small community, probably anywhere, and it's hard to spread the word, and a lot of speech therapists are really not very confident in this area. So I, I've written a book um, and it was published it's a, for speech and language therapists because a lot of the research in this area is in journal articles and you know scientific, really scientific things that A, you have to really look for, B, lots of NHS you know, trusts are like what are cutting money and they cut money to lobbies and things that, so I'm trying, I've, 
that I sound bitter and twisted, don't I? Um, <laughs> so it's, it's very hard to get to these journal articles. So I've written a book on providing speech therapy to people with dementia and progressive diseases and with language difficulties, and it really focuses mainly, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of Jill has read it, I think. Um, 80 to 90 percent is focused on primary progressive aphasia, and there's a whole chapter on commissioning services and some ideas for speech therapists to do that, some really practical things, because it is, I, we, I often feel that speech therapists feel very really helpless, there's only a couple of us, and then the rest of the people don't really know much about it. Um, so that would be kind of addressing that point you're making um, and hopefully with my getting some more funding um, I, I will be able to um, do a bigger study. I'm involved in lots, a couple of professional networks to hopefully spread the word. I, um, so that should help. But yeah, it, is, it does feel like a, um, a big mission at the minute. There's, lot, there's lots of, often the case studies that I commented on in the literature, a lot of people do say that planning for the future is really hard and even doing those naming therapies for people when they're actually at the very beginning of their disease, that while they're still able to do the naming therapies, some people start doing them and they say, no, this is rubbing salt in the wounds. Every day I'm practicing the words I'm going to lose. It's, it's too overwhelming. And I've had so many people start and then finish because it's too much to so, yeah, so yeah, as you say, just summarising so everyone can hear, so focusing on the future every six months, it's really tricky. I agree. Should, should we go to you? Sometimes if you've lost language but also lost planning skills, you actually, you just get stuck on finding that exact right word and actually any questions are not going to help. Because and I think that that's where right. actually I think sometimes speech therapy's been been so or only all the research is so focused just on the person with primary progressive aphasia who's got so much else going on. I mean, everyone in the family has, but actually, speech therapy has also needs to try and focus on the people around that person as well, the, um, to, so that you can focus on the team really and the conversation, the team who are having that conversation because. The person with primary progressive aphasia can't do it all, and they need. And the person, there was a study done this year actually. Do you know that one, Jill? And um, by Rydell, and they did it. It was in America, I think. But they looked at the number of people with primary progressive aphasia who were seeing a speech therapist, and the number of people who'd seen a speech therapist was very small. So I don't think like. I think it was 30% of people with this primary progressive aphasia had seen a speech therapist. But they also looked at the number of so carers of that person with PPA and the amount of support the carers have got. And compared to all the other dementia variants, people with PPA carers, I think, get hardly, they, it, was, it was 7% of help compared to whatever percent everybody else was getting. So it, it just, I wasn't sure what all that help entailed, but it was such a small percentage. And now I think that's where, in my opinion, speech therapy needs to work with both people to support both people so that neither of the people are left out and they're on their own and struggling to hold that weight up like Zoe Smith is in that picture. It is, and I would say, um, I was talking at a, a, a networking um, speech therapy group on Tuesday and we were talking about the number of patients we feel don't fit into those you know, logopenic or, uh, or semantic, or they don't fit neatly. And we were saying that there's a large number of those. And, and we were talking about, is that because there is other variants that we, have, we just haven't found yet, or that no one can agree on? Or is it because, and this is what some researchers have said, is it because we don't catch people early enough? And actually, as people progress, you, you actually develop symptoms from all the different variants and, you, and, and we know that people don't just have language symptoms all the way through, they then start getting memory, which isn't part of the first, um, you know, those first things that fit with the, you know, people who are initially diagnosed with primary progressive aphasia are not meant to have memory problems or any other thinking difficulties for the first certain number of years. 
But by the time they've got to a service, they probably have. So things progress. And it is tricky as well. That's the other thing. You know, when I'm, I'm picking out all these little things, and often I say to, I say it to nurses on boards a lot, what you need, all you need to do is talk in short sentences, and everything will be fine. And then they look at me and they say, oh yeah, that's no problem. And they go, I, go, I, go, I went in to watch a nurse um, change me a catheter back, and she went in and she said, right, John, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and isn't it nice? Like, no, blah, 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 blah. And he, and he was, yeah. And I said, no, 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 that's not simple. It's not short at all. Um, and she said, yeah, it's, it's really simple. And, she, and so I then, <laughs> it's really hard to actually do it. Um, and, and to remember to do it and to continue 